Welcome to the Bible study for Waymaker Messianic Jewish and Christian Center USA. We pray that this is a blessing for each and every one of you who are here with us and for those who will listen much later and on the archives. This week we're going to begin the book of Exodus and we will be reading through chapters 1 through 6. Before we begin, I'd like to open this up with our opening prayer and invite the Holy Spirit in to lead us. Father God, we thank you. We thank you so much for the ability to be together first and foremost. We thank you for your word that we are going to be reading tonight. Your word is faithful and true. And we give you the honor. We give you the glory. We give you all the praise, and we ask your Holy Spirit to come lead us, guide us, direct us, open the eyes of our heart and the ears of our heart, and bring to revelation the things that you want us to grasp from tonight's session. And we thank you so much, Father God, for sending us your Holy Spirit to guide us and teach us. Help us to be that open receptacle that receives your word, ingests your word, and makes it part of our being and our daily walk with you. We thank you, Father God, for everything that you do, everything that you will do, in the mighty name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, Amen and Amen. So we're going to pick up the story of the children of Israel in captivity, actually, in Egypt. Um, they are dealing with a Pharaoh who does not remember Joseph and all the great things that Joseph did to preserve the people. And we're picking up in a, in a different time frame now. And time has elapsed. And this Pharaoh does not know who Joseph was. Exodus chapter 1, Israel increases greatly in Egypt. These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulon, and Benjamin, Dan and Naphtali, Gad and Asher. All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. Then. Joseph died, and all his brothers and all that generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew, to, grew exceedingly strong, so that the land was filled with them. Pharaoh oppresses Israel. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore they set taskmasters masters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh stores, for, for Pharaoh store cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shipreth and the other Pua, when you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women, and see them on the birth stool. If it is a son, you shall kill him. But if, but if it is a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this thing and let the male children live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, as the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. 
So God dealt well with the midwives and the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every son that is born to the Hebrews, you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. Chapter 2, the birth of Moses. Now a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a, a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and dabbed it with bit rumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the river by the river bank, and his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, while her young women walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman, and she took it. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Well, this was, of course, Moses' sister, so she knew who to call. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. When the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. Now, this bit rumen that was mentioned is she dabbed it with bit rumen. It's kind of like an asphalt type of substance. Um, kind of like to make it more water watertight so it, it was treated with with that so that there that it would not sink obviously and it would you know the child would be protected the next segment in chapter two moses flees to midian one day when moses had grown up he went out to his people and looked on their burdens and he saw an egyptian beating a hebrew one of his people he looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. When he went out the next day, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together. And he said to the man in the wrong, Why do you strike your companion? He answered, Who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, Surely the thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. The shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and saved them and watered their flock. When they came home to their father, Ruel, now, he, he's also going to be known as Jethro, uh, just a spoiler alert. Um, how is it that you have come home so soon today? They said, an Egyptian delivered us out of the hands of the shepherds and even drew water for us and watered the flock. He said to his daughters, then where is he? Why have you left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. And Moses was content to dwell with the man and he gave Moses his daughter, Zipporah. She gave birth to a son, and he called his name Gershon, for he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. And the third part of chapter 2 is God hears Israel's groaning. During those many years, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God. And God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. Now, just to let you know that uh, the first 40 years of Moses' life was spent in Egypt. And then when he, fl he fled Egypt, he, he spent 
another 40 years in Midian, and then the last 40 years were the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness uh, with Benaiah Israel, with the children of Israel, until his death at 120 years old. Chapter 3, The Burning Bush. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro. Here, as I mentioned, it was a spoiler alert. Ruel is also known as Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush, of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to, to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me. And I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, But I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and Isaac, of Isaac and of Jacob, has appeared to me, saying, I have observed, observed you and what has been done to you in Egypt, and I promise that I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. And they will listen to your voice, and you and the elders of Israel should go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. And now please let us go a three days' journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. After that, he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And when you go, you shall not go empty. But each woman shall ask of her neighbor and any woman who lives in her house for silver and gold, jewelry, and for clothing. You shall put them on your sons and on your daughters. So you shall plunder the Egyptians. And in our Torah portion this past Saturday, all the things that they plundered them with, um, the, the Lord God actually was asking um, for the children of Israel to donate, to make the tabernacle. So these materials would go into making the tabernacle, the gold, the silver, the bronze, the, the, the materials. 
chapter four, Moses given powerful signs. And Moses answered, but behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say the Lord did not appear to you. The Lord said to him, what is it that is in your hand? He said, a staff. And he said, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground and it became a serpent. And Moses ran from it. But the Lord said to Moses, put out your hand and catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand and caught it and it became a staff in his hand. They may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Again, the Lord said to him, put your hand inside your cloak. And he put his hand inside his cloak. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous. So it had leprosy on his hand. It was like snow. It was white. Then God said, put your hand back inside your cloak. So he put his hand back inside his cloak. And when he took it out, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. If they will not believe you, God said, or listen to the first sign, they may believe the latter sign. If they will not believe even these two signs or listen to your voice, you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. And the water then you shall take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. But Moses said to the Lord, Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. Then the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who made him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now therefore go. I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. But he said, Oh, my Lord, please send someone else. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well. Behold, he is coming out to meet you, and when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth, and will teach you both what to do. He shall speak for you to, to the people, and he shall be your mouth, and you shall be as God to him. And take in your hand this staff with, with which you shall do the signs. Moses returns to Egypt. This is the, the other part of chapter 4. Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Please let me go back to my brothers in Egypt to see whether they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. And the Lord said to Moses and Midian, Go back to Egypt, for all the men who were seeking your life are dead. So Moses took his wife and his sons and had them ride on a donkey and went back to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the staff of God in his hand. And the Lord said to Moses, when you go go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that that I have put in your power. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son, and I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met him and sought to put him to death. Then Zipporah took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it and said, Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him alone. It was then that she said a bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. The Lord said to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So, so he went and met him at the mountain of God and kissed him. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord with which he had sent him to speak and all the signs that he had commanded him to do. Then Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the people of Israel. Aaron spoke all the words that the Lord had spoken to Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people. And the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel and and that he had seen their affliction, they bowed their heads in worship. Chapter 5, Making Bricks Without Straw. Afterward, Moses Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go that they they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, 
who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. Then they said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go a three days' journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with a sword. But the king of Egypt said to, to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people away from their work? Get back to your burdens. And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land are now many, and you make them rest from their burdens. This same day Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their foremen, You shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks, as in the past. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. But the number of bricks that they make, that, that they made in the past, you shall impose on them. You shall by no means reduce it, for they are idle. Therefore they cry, let us go and offer sacrifice to our God. Let heavier work be laid on the men that they may labor at it and pay no regard to line words. So the taskmasters and the foremen of the people went out and said to the people, thus says Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. Go and get your straw yourselves wherever you can find it, but your work will not be reduced in the least. So the people were scattered throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble for straw. The taskmasters were urgent, saying, Complete your work, your daily task, each day as when there, were, there was straw. And the foremen of the people of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and were asked, Why have you not done all your tasks? of making bricks today and yesterday as in the past. Then the foremen of the people of Israel came and cried to Pharaoh, Why do you treat your servants like this? No straw is given to your servants, yet they say to us, Make bricks. And behold, your servants are beaten, but the, the fault is in your own people. But he said, You are idle. You are idle. That is why you say, Let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Go now and work. No straw will be given you, but you must still deliver the same number of bricks. The four men of the people of Israel saw that they were in trouble when they said, You shall by no means reduce your number of bricks, your daily task each day. They met Moses and Aaron, who were waiting for them as they came out from Pharaoh, and said to them, The Lord look on you and judge, because you have made us stink in the sight of Pharaoh, and his servants have put a sword in their hand to kill us. Then Moses turned to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. Chapter 6 God promises deliverance, but the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand he will send them out, and with a strong hand he will drive, drive them out of his land. God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name the Lord I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. Say, therefore, to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. And with great acts of judgment, I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. Moses spoke thus to the people. Of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. So the Lord said to Moses, Go in, tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the people of Israel go out of his land. But Moses said to the Lord, Behold, the people of Israel have not listened to me. How then shall Pharaoh listen to me? For I am uncirc of uncircumcised lips. 
So the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them a charge about the people of Israel and about Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. The next segment is the genealogy of Moses and Aaron. These are the heads of the father's house, the son of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, Hena, Talu, Hezron, and Carmi. These are the clans of Reuben, the son of Simeon, Jemiel, Janan, Ohad, Zachin, Zohar, and Shal, the sons of, the, of a Canaanite woman. These are the clans of Simeon. These are the names of the sons of Levi according to their generations. Gershon, Kohath, and Merari, the years of the life of Levi, being 137 years, the son of Gershon, Libni and Shemia, Shemia, by their clan, the sons of Kohath, Amram, Izhar, Hebron, and Uziel, the years of the life of Kohath, being 133 years, the sons of Merari, Mali Amushi, these are the clans of the Levites according to their generation. Amram took as his wife, Jochebed, his father's sister, and she bore him Aaron and Moses, the years of the life of Amram being 137 years. And also know that there's a sister, Miriam, and we'll be, we'll be tuning into to that a little bit later. The sons of Ishar, Korah, Nepheg, and Zikri, the sons of Uziel, Mishael, Elzathan, and, and Sithri, Aaron took as his wife, Elisheba, the daughter of Amenadab and the sister of Nash Nashan. And she bore him Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. The sons of Korah, Asir, Elkanah, Abiasaph, these are the clans of the Kor Korahites. Eleazar, Aaron's son, took as his wife one of the daughters of Putiel, and she bore him Phineas. These are the heads of the father's houses of the Levites by their clans. These are the are the Aaron and these are the Aaron and Moses to whom the Lord said, Bring out the people of Israel from the land of Egypt by their hosts. It was they who spoke to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, about bringing out the people of Israel from Egypt. This Moses and this Aaron. On the day when the Lord spoke to Moses in the land of Egypt, the Lord said to Moses, I am the Lord. Tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, all that I say to you. But Moses said to the Lord, Behold, I am of uncircumcised lips. How will Pharaoh listen to me? That is the end of our Bible study for tonight, the reading part. We're going to recap a little bit on this. Now, once again, to let you know that the author of the book of Exodus is Moses, um, as was the book of Genesis. It is thought that Exodus was written around 1450 to 1400 BC by Moses during the 40 years that Israel wandered through the wilderness on the way to the promised land. This is after they did get out of Egypt. The central message of the book of Exodus is deliverance. And when we think about deliverance, we think about um, Yeshua. We think about Jesus um, because he delivered the he delivered all of humanity out of the bondage of the slavery of sin to the evil, you know, for the evil one. Um, actually, took us out of the evil one's grip because sin separates us from our Creator, from God. So here was deliverance out of oppression when you know that uh, the evil one oppresses humanity. Um, so there, there is a type and shadow here. And Moses was the person to lead the people through God to lead the people out of Egypt. So deliverance is the, is the central message and, or it's also known as the outgoing of the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. The book of Exodus is the story of the birth of Israel as a nation. It is a story that is dominated by the central figure of Moses, the hero whom God chooses to lead Benai Israel out of slavery from, from the Egyptians. The book gets its name from the Exodus or exit from Egypt. 
Exodus describes the many miracles that God performs as he guides his people from Egypt to the promised land through face-to-face -face encounters with God and other events. And we're going we're gonna to see that all unfold. Moses received the revelation of those things God wanted him to share. Guided by the Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit, Moses communicated what God revealed to him to the people, both orally and in written form. The book of Exodus is a book of redemption. In the book of Genesis, we saw the fall of man because of sin. In the book of Exodus, we see the redemption of man by blood and the power of God. And again, we see this, we're going to see this when we get to the story of the Passover as a type and shadow of Jesus, uh, which will happen uh, much later. It is, a, it is a type and shadow. It's a rehearsal of you know, when the real um, Passover lamb uh, took away the sin of the world. The book of Exodus is the continuation of the story of, of the small family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, whom God chose in the book of Genesis, and how this small family grew into 70 people in number by the time Jacob moved into moved to Egypt with jo to be with Joseph um, at Joseph's request. And then um, from there, 400 years later, um, they're a large nation. So um, they grew, it, they actually grew into a na nation of 600,000 men, not, uh, and, and also uh, plus women and children at the time of the exodus from Egypt. The seed of Abraham grew very rapidly in Egypt from the original 70 who sojourned there with Jacob after Joseph rescued his family from the famine. They grew so rapidly that the Egyptians became afraid of the number and they enslaved them all. And they did not remember Joseph, the, the, the Pharaoh of Egypt, the king of Egypt did not remember Joseph and all that he had done. Exodus is, is the record of the development of Moses as a leader, the deliverance of, of Israel from slavery in Egypt, the trip from Egypt to Mount Sinai to receive God's law and God's instructions to Moses to build a tabernacle. And as we proceed, the book will end with the building of the tabernacle as a dwelling place for God. So we just read the first, the first six chapters. Um, what we're going to see here um, in the organization of the book as, as we continue to read. If we were to divide this into three segments, we see the Exodus from Egypt um, will be Exodus chapters 1 through 18. Giving of the law um, is chapters 19 to 24 and chapters 25 to 40 is God's tabernacle. So we're going to be um, getting into all of that. So in chapters 1 through 18, we're going to see the miraculous deliverance of Israel. We haven't gotten there yet. We haven't even gotten to the plagues. That's a spoiler alert for those that have not been with us through uh, the Torah, uh, the Torah readings on Shabbat. We've been past that actually already. Um, and also through our, our first Bible study, we went through this. And so spoiler alert, you can see a lot of interesting things happen. A lot of signs, a lot of wonders uh, from the Lord. So Moses the Deliverer was, was, was born at the beginning of what we read this week. And his first 40 years, he spent as an Egyptian prince because Pharaoh's daughter rescued him from the Nile and made him her son. So then when Moses had to flee, as we, we saw, because he killed an Egyptian and his life was sought after, he fled and, and lived for 40 years in Midian with, uh, with his father-in-law, Jethro, first introduced as Ruel, and he married one of Jethro's daughters, Zipporah, and had two sons. Um, and they were in Midian for 40 years. And then at age 80, 
he's he's going before Pharaoh and saying, let my people go. Um, and then what we're going to see later is the 40 years of wandering um, in the wilderness is the last third of Moses' life. Uh, Moses announced deliverance for, for Israel in Exodus chapter 4. So, and God actually showed Moses what he needed to do. He turned his staff into a serpent and, um, and then also turned his hand in and, and made it full of leprosy and then restored it as signs to get through to the people. So, um, we have not gotten to the signs yet, and we will be getting to that. This is the building up of a very exciting story in Exodus and how the people are actually delivered from slavery, from bondage. And as I said, you know, this is also a type and shadow spiritually um, what Jesus has done for humanity. The oppression of sin is a type of bondage. Uh, it separates us from, sin separates us from our Father in heaven. So Jesus restored that and redeemed um, redeemed us through his sacrifice. We'll get to all of that as we go through when we get to the Passover section. So that's just a quick recapping of, uh, of this week's lesson. And as you noticed, I, I do also want to mention how Moses Moses. Moses was trying to talk himself out of his calling and God kind of put, you know, put, put it, things into perspective for him. Like who made, who do you think made your mouth? I can put words into your mouth. You just let me do what I need to do. You just, you know, I will put words into your mouth uh, because he was saying, I'm not an eloquent speaker. I'm not, I, I, I'm slow of speech. Um, but he became a very, very powerful leader for the people, as you're going to see. And God did allow Aaron to come and help him uh, to be his spokesman. And Aaron became the first high priest as well um, from the tribe of Levi, of Levi, actually. And you're going to see how this all evolves as we go through the Bible. Um, through through the Torah portion of the Bible, actually. So that's all that I'm going to say say for now, and we will be continuing on next week with the Book of Exodus. We're going to close this out in a prayer, and then open up to our altar call. Father God, we thank you for your powerful word. We thank you for all that you do. For you're an amazing and awesome God, and with you, all things are possible. And we can see how you gave courage to Moses to do what he needed to do, and he followed and obeyed you, and you were with him the whole way. And, and you were preparing him for what you were about to do. You were setting the stage for, for something very miraculous. And of course, it is all for your glory. We love you, Father God. There is no one like you. And you never stopped moving across your earth. And we know that you're moving now. And you will also release your children from the oppression of the evil one in the world that we live in today. Because there is so much wickedness that has been spread across this planet by the evil one. But we know you don't miss anything and we know that you're on the move and about to release your people your people who are called by your name who have been crying out to you and standing in the gap for those that do not yet know you but will know you thank you father god we thank you for everything that you have done for everything that you are doing and everything that you're about to do because it is exciting what you're about to do and the world will know that yes you are god you are god almighty praise you we praise you we give you glory 
and give you honor. We love you, Father God. In the mighty name of Jesus, Yeshua, amen and amen. Speaking of Jesus, Jesus came and died for each and every one of us, for all of humanity, for all of humanity. Before he came, there was a sacrificial system that was put in place. It was another type and shadow, okay? Because of the original sin that we have read about, that we have discussed in the garden with Adam and Eve, there had to be some form of redemption. So as we move through the Bible, you're going to see if you were with us for, um, we, we talked a little bit about this at Shabbat, um, the, the building of the tabernacle was also a place where God would dwell with them, but, but there was, there was, there was certain things that would be done there to actually cover sin, the sins of the people once a year. But again, it didn't take it away. And, and by covering the sins of the people, they had to select perfect, perfect animals. And most of the time they were lambs. Um, they were blemish free. Uh, there could not be anything physically wrong with, with the animal. And that animal was sacrificed for the sins of the people. It didn't take the sins away, of course. So it had to, you know, kept, you know, Every year, this this went on and on and on and on. Now, when Jesus was born, Jesus died on a cross. When when Jesus was born, he um, was he was he came to Earth for the very purpose of eventually dying on a cross for us. He sojourned with uh, with mankind here, um, had a ministry, um, starting at age thirty to about thirty three. And he died on a cross. Horrific death. Uh, he sacrificed him, himself um, for the sins of the world because he was not born in the same line as what you and I are born through, that, that fleshly line um, that traces back to Adam. Um, he was not born through that line. He was born of a virgin, and God breathed his spirit into that girl into Mary. And so he is second of the Godhead. So he came blameless, sinless, perfect, nothing wrong with him, just as a type and shadow of that little, those little lambs that had to be blemish free, spotless, perfect. Jesus did not have any sin. He committed no sin while he was on this earth. Yes, he was tempted of the devil, as we we will later read also. But he did not fall for anything the devil tried. He abided in the Father, in the Father and him. And he was here for the sole purpose of redeeming us. Through his shed blood, through his death, burial, and resurrection, we also can have eternal life and be with the Father. What he did was reverse the curse that was placed on mankind through the, the sin in the garden. However, you just don't automatically, you know, get to go to heaven. You need to take an action too. And that action is going to Jesus in prayer, asking to be forgiven of sins and accepting him as your Lord and Savior. It's a very simple act. Um, to do. However, the world will complicate all, uh, the devil likes to complicate all things and, and using the world. So the world, I don't want to say the world complicates things, the people complicate things. And the devil has put out a lot of false things and uses people to put out a lot of false doctrine. And some of the false doctrine out there is there are many paths that lead to heaven. No, there's not. There's one. His name is Jesus. And he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one will come to the Father except by me. Now, yes, his Hebrew name is Yeshua. Um, 
And that name means salvation. And that is exactly what he came to do to give us salvation. Salvation is deliverance from sin and their consequences. And Jesus took all of the sins of the world with him when he laid down his life on the cross so that the world could be redeemed of sin forever and reconciled to the Father. It was through his shed blood he paid our sin debt in full. And the wages of sin are death, separation from our Creator forever. So he took that upon, upon him so that we may have life and have it more abundantly. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We are born into that because of, the, because of what happened in the garden. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says, But God commanded his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Jesus died for us, giving us that way, that path to redemption that we did not have before. We cannot save ourselves. We needed a Savior. This is why he came the first time in that manner. He's not coming that way the second time. He's coming as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He's coming as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to rule and reign. And he will rule and reign and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord even those that reject him even the devil and his minions because he is king of kings he is lord of lords now i don't know why anyone would want to walk in this world without jesus without being saved, without having that blessed assurance of what's going to happen to you after you leave this world. And everybody's going to die. I mean, I know there's elitists that think that they can mold into, uh, <laughs> become transhuman, and that that is what they're aiming for um, in their twisted thinking and what the devil has fed to them. Um, but <laughs> That, that doesn't make them human. We are born into human bodies. And if you alter that human body, you're, then, then that, doesn't, that doesn't mean you're going to live forever as a human being. But, but if you're going to turn yourself into something else, what does that make you? You know, I've heard all kinds of things, have been, you know, have read all kinds of things. And God made you a certain way with a DNA. Uh, he knitted you in your mother's womb. He made you perfectly and wonderfully. Changing yourself is not going to uh, make a hill of beans difference. He made you who you are, period. And as human beings living in a fleshly body, we have a time that we're born and we have a time that we will die and God chooses that however our spirit exits this body that that we inhabit while we are in this temporary life it exits and we enter into an eternity an eternal life now, where you decide you're going to spend eternity is the decisions that you make in this physical body. I want to make that very clear. It is an individual choice. Our creator, God Almighty, who created humanity, who created everything on this earth, make no mistake, he is the creator. He has also given us free will. We can choose to worship him or we can choose not to worship him. We can choose salvation or we can reject it. There's many people that think that they can be their own gods. Well, that's not so. Many people that 
choose to worship idols such as money such as statues such as other people themselves um they there's a, there's a lot of worship of a lot of different things that's idolatry that's not the true god however you know like i said god gives us free will to choose there are consequences to the choices that we do make, but he does not impose himself on us. So you as an individual will make a choice to repent of your sins, to ask for forgiveness and, and, and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, or you won't. But if you're not born again and if you're not saved, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. In the Gospel of John, chapter 3, Jesus teaches all of that to Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee, actually, who met with Jesus at night. And he asked, Jesus would teach him, and Jesus taught him about um, being born again, born of spirit and water. And he said to Nicodemus, if, if you're not born of spirit and water, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. You know, Nicodemus at first, you know, didn't understand. He's like, but, you know, how can a man uh, be born again? Does he enter his mother's womb and be born again? How does that happen? You know, when you're already old. <laughs> um, and Jesus said, flesh is of the flesh spirit is of the spirit he was he was speaking of being born again through him he is the way the truth and the life he gave his life he died on a cross he was buried and he resurrected and he defeated death and the sting of death he defeated the evil one with his death so that we could be redeemed and we could also have eternal life with him but that's a choice that you make it's an independent choice no one can make it for you i mean people can pray for you we do pray for the lost souls and um that they see the truth we pray for them all the time but we can't make your choice for you so choose this day whom you will serve So I'm going to open this up to anyone that would like to say this prayer with me. Anyone that would like to be saved, be born again, you can say this prayer with me now. Dear God, I come to you today to confess that I am a sinner and I'm asking you to forgive me. I need a Savior and I know that Savior is the Messiah. It, I know Jesus is the one. I thank you, Jesus, for, for what you did for me, what you did for everyone when you gave your own life. Please forgive me of my sins and help me to live a better life. Jesus, I accept the gift of salvation that you're offering and the gift of eternal life. And I declare you today as the King of Kings, as my Lord. Thank you for giving me that opportunity. I believe you are the Savior. I believe you are the Messiah. I believe you came. I believe you died. I believe you were buried. I believe you resurrected and are sitting at the right hand of the Father this very moment. And I believe you're coming again. I also believe you, you took stripes. And one of those stripes was for healing. And by your stripes, I'm also healed of illness and affliction. You said when you died on the cross, it is finished. And that meant everything. You came and you accomplished everything that was to be accomplished. Thank you. Thank you for all that you have done. I'm asking you, please come live inside my heart and rule and reign over my heart and send your Holy Spirit to live inside me, to guide me in all your ways for the rest of my life. I believe. I believe through you and you alone, Yeshua.
Jesus, that I am saved, I am healed, I am born again and delivered and set free from sin and their consequences. And I believe through you and you alone, Jesus, that I am healed and now healthy of mind, body, and soul. And Jesus, Yeshua's precious, mighty, awesome, and powerful name. Amen. And if you've said that prayer with me, welcome to the family of God. I am going to encourage you to get into a Bible-based church or a Messianic congregation, one that teaches from the Bible. There are many denominations out there that teach not straight from the Bible, and they they teach a mixed doctrine of things and mixed uh, religions and what have you. We are not to mix. We are not to mix worldly things with what's in the Bible. So we need to really be careful about that. Be careful who you listen to. There are many wolves in sheep's clothing, as they say. They may appear to be okay, and yet they're they're ravenous wolves. And this is the words of Jesus himself, warning warning the people then, and that's a warning to us now. Um, there was there was a lot of false teachers out there um, back then, so there is many many, 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 many that are out there today. So be careful. How do you know? How do you know that you're getting sound doctrine? I would encourage you to get a copy of the Bible yourself. Get a copy of the Bible yourself and start reading it. Um, the one thing that you 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 need to do also is say a prayer before you sit down and read the Bible. Ask the Holy Spirit to guide you to, to give you, give you that um, revelation as to what you're reading and what what you should gather from what you're reading. The Holy Spirit is an awesome teacher, an awesome guide, and you've asked Him to come to live inside of you, and so He will. He is. Jesus, when he left this world, he he said, he told the disciples that he would send a comforter, and that is the Holy Spirit. And on the day of Pentecost, um, the Holy Spirit came and was there with, with the disciples in the upper room. We'll get to all of that later, um, but that's uh, a little spoiler alert. But the Holy Spirit is is so, so important. He is also known as the restrainer. He is the one that is holding back the evil. Even though we see a lot of evil uh, rising in this world, there is still good here because the Holy Spirit is still here. Living inside of all believers. And the devil just absolutely hates all of us. So he hates humanity first and foremost because we were created in God's image. And that just made him jealous right from the beginning. So he he just absolutely will do anything to trip humanity up. So be careful. Absolutely be careful. Read the word of God. Um Get into a Bible study, uh, you know, a, a local Bible study to where you live, where you can actually, um, as long as it's sound doctrine being taught, you can actually get into to discussing. Um, if there's things that you don't understand, um, you can discuss that um, as well. There's always something to be learned in the Bible, and we will we will go through our lives and still not understand every little intricate detail. Something we will learn till the day that we die, um, and that is that is a fact. So there's there's not anyone walking on this planet that can say they know it all because they don't. Um, so the Bible is a living word of God because we have a living father in heaven. And yes, you, he is now your heavenly father. If you were born again into the family of God, you may call him Abba father. And you can have a relationship with your heavenly father. He, he longs for that anyway. He loves to hear his children talk to him. So revere him also as your heavenly father. And this, the Holy Bible, is his message to his people. You are one of his people now. And he loves you. 
He loved you so much that he that he gave Jesus, his only begotten son, who died for everyone. That's love that you cannot even begin to understand. But that is our Father in heaven who loves loves humanity so much. So I'm going to also encourage you to get into small groups. If you join a local church or messianic congregation, there may be small groups that you can join you know, these are groups that are going on within that congregation that you decide to join. There could be men's groups, there could be women's groups, there could be teaching groups, um, you know, learning learning a certain topic of the Bible, um, like spiritual warfare. Everybody needs to be learning spiritual warfare. We are in such a spiritual battle between good and evil right now. So everyone needs to, to be fully armed with that knowledge. So if that is being offered, please jump right in um, because you need to know how to war in this spirit. So that is real important. Prayer groups, intercessory prayer groups. Absolutely. Um, being part of an intercessory prayer team is important. We are to pray one for another. Individual prayer, uh, develop a prayer life, talk to God, take everything to the Lord in prayer. This is how you have a relationship with him too, is by taking it to him in prayer. So there are many versions of the Bible. I Some of the versions of the Bible that are very sound are the King James Version, New King James Version. The Messianic Jewish Family Bible, Tree of Life Version. The Complete Jewish Bible has all 66 books of the Bible. Um, and we are reading now from the English Standard Version, very sound, the NASB, um, the NLT, the NIV. Those are sound versions of the Bible. So um, whatever, I, I, would, I would recommend you going to Bible Hub or Bible Gateway so you can actually sample um, those versions out and then get a hard copy of the Bible. It's really good to have that hard copy in your hand. You can read it, turn the pages, put notes there, uh, what have you. Um, but definitely reading the Bible is, is very important. And with that, we're going to bring our, our, our Bible study to a close with the Aaronic Blessing. The priest is also known as the priestly blessing. This is found in Numbers chapter 6, verses 22 to 27, when the Lord spoke to Moses, instructing Moses to, to speak to Aaron and Aaron's sons to bless the children of Israel with specific words and put his name upon them. God puts his name on his people. And you who are a member of the, the family of God, when you're born again, um, God puts his name on you and this blessing is for his people. And in Hebrew, it goes like this. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Shalom. Amen. And may you have peace. The peace that passes all understanding comes from the Lord. The world, the world may be in chaos and calamity and running in, around in fear, but we, can have peace through our Lord. Bring it to the Lord. Be in his presence. Allow him to give you that peace. It's really tough times out there and we need to have that. And also, I'm going to encourage each and every one of you. We do meet, our ministry meets live and in real time on freeconferencecall.com on Tuesday evenings, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You are more than welcome to come join us. 
Uh, this is so important for the body of Messiah to meet uh, and to support one another. We talk about things that are going on in our world, how it relates biblically. Um, we support one another um, and also pray one for another. We lift up prayer requests. Uh, so that is really important. We do truly fellowship, and it's been a complete blessing um, for those that um, do participate in, in, in the Tuesday night meeting. So come one, come all. You're all welcome to join us. Uh, we can hold up to a 1,000 people, so uh, everyone is welcome. So I am going to say Shavua Tov. Have a good week. Still early enough in the week to say that. God bless each and every one of you, and we will continue with the Bible study next week, um, and we will be reading um, Exodus chapter 7 through 18, so we will get through um, that first third if we were to divide the, the, the book of Exodus into those segments, as we mentioned. Uh, we will be completing that next week. So have a good week, everyone. God bless you.